Dr. Sugira, welcome to Eurotrash. Thank you for having me. Since you recently published an article about him, let's start with Andrew Tate, the famous self-proclaimed misogynist and influencer who is currently sitting in jail, I think somewhere in Bucharest in Romania, on sexual assault and human trafficking charges, although somehow still managing to tweet bad poetry from his jail cell. Um, so much like probably every other guy last year, also this year, my social media feeds were bombarded with Andrew Tate's uh, clips and statements, some of which were that women are men's property, that depression doesn't exist, only being a loser does, and my personal favorite, that sleep is for cowards, because real men obviously grind all the time. Now, the more I listened to him, the more he just seemed like one of those sad older guys in the local pub we probably all know who are not doing particularly well and just keep drunkenly shouting that women belong in, in the kitchen and that's why the, the world is so messed up. Now, in real life, we don't take these types seriously. In fact, they're an example of what not to be and how not to behave. Um, so I guess my question is, why are so many people taking Andrew Tate seriously? So oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the, the fundamental point here is that although too too many, us included by the sound of it, that you know, we he seems a figure of ridicule, but actually his messages, everything that he has created for himself, this alpha male persona, is incredibly appealing. It has touched a nerve with young men and boys who are somehow struggling with their identity and feel that he is the only role model that they have, that they need to aspire to this very narrow perspective of manhood, that they should be controlling and abusing women, that their only importance and self-worth is in their physique and money and fast cars. And they, you know, and, and unfortunately, they're not really kind of seeing beyond that in terms of how damaging and toxic that influence is. Most of these young men who are Andrew Tate fans have like mothers and sisters and female friends or maybe even daughters in their lives, right? People who they care about. And, and yet when they hear Andrew Tate say, for example, that women are responsible for getting sexually assaulted, they kind of negate these relationships. I just read an, an article on CNN an hour ago where a young woman from Britain detailed how her two brothers who were her best friends before suddenly became cold and aggressive and, and dominating once they started following Andrew Tate online. They basically became different people. Yeah. Maybe this is more a question for a psychologist or something, but what is so appealing in these messages that it makes some people turn on, on folks who've, who they've known their whole lives? Well... I, so it's, it's, I mean, what, what it's doing is offering them a, a sort of excuse or um, a perspective then that for all their problems. So right. if, if, so we've already identified and research has shown that it's, it's predominantly younger, younger men and boys yeah. that are more susceptible to Andrew Tate or following Andrew Tate have joined as Hustlers University. Um, and the adolescence is a hard time anyway right? Um, young men and boys are being bombarded now, not just from Andrew Tate and his ilk, but from wider mainstream that somehow that they're in crisis, that it, it is bad to be a man, that movements like Me Too have somehow had a really detrimental effect on men rather than obviously trying to tackle sexual violence. Um, and so there are young men who are feeling threatened and then you get somebody like Andrew Tate, who's this presents himself as this maverick, you know, it's countercultural. He's offering them this different perspective um, where all their problems are external. It's not their fault. And it's obviously presented in a very unnuanced fashion as well. Oh, women are the problem. Um, and so uncomfortable as it may seem, then it's it's. <sighs> 
it, it's, it's easy then for some to just generalize all women to be the same, irrespective of, you know, family members, people that, that they actually love and care for. Um, and, and certainly through my research, I've actually seen this where um, they can still, I mean, they can almost reconcile um, that that kind of belief in you know, women as evil or that they, women should be subjugated um, as uh, even with the fact that they still love love their, their family members but it's almost it's, it's, it's kind of biological reasoning as well well they can't help it they're women they're just born this way um, but yeah they you know they're still lesser than men so it's just buying into really antiquated ideas of sex roles so you can go, I love my mom, but she should follow my orders. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how they essentially, yeah, they, you know, you're and my mom, no I love you, but you're yeah. still less than me. You're still worthless because you're a woman. Um, and there's even the tension then of <laughs> you were born from a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a hate, there's a resentment there as well that, you know, that, that they came from women <laughs> so that's really an awkward as well to, to address <laughs> it, this doesn't seem like a very comfortable place to have this in your mind all of these oppo opposing you know views like okay i love my mom you know but she should be subjugated you know my yeah. sister's cool but you know my sister's a woman so she she should do it as i say and stuff i, I just it's kind of hard to imagine this being a desirable, comfortable place, you know, no, for to operate that's, in the world. I mean, that, that's that's really important. It's not healthy. This isn't. He presents himself, and there's even been people that support him who say, "Oh, he does amazing things for young men. He's challenging depression. He's encouraging young men who would otherwise be isolated to go out, um, look for a, a better job or a job, or go to the gym, and all of those." in their own on their own without the context of everything else he's doing yeah great but then as you already highlighted he says it, depressions for losers um says that women should take responsibility or sorry some responsibility for being raped um and so <laughs> yeah it's and 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 of course any any boy or young man that doesn't fit that alpha manhood that that you know that all powerful male who's successful in you know, particular areas like sex and money and sports and fast cars and things well then they're gonna feel less than as well they're gonna feel really inadequate anyway striving to reach something which is you know a huge facade you know how he's made that is you know arguably from criminal activity which he is now being you know he's in jail for um and from the pyramid schemes he is you know, so so he is actually profiteering from from the people that are following him the people that are looking up to him that are looking for guidance um that he has commodified misogyny the other part of what makes the andrew tate phenomena so mind-boggling is that it's all just an obvious scam right? Designed yes. to sell his atrocious yes. get rich quick schemes to desperate guys. For That's all it. of this, you know, self empowering talk, he's actually getting rich by making men feel more victimized or victimized and even more powerless because he says Absolutely. that everyone is against them, right? Absolutely. And there's nothing new. He is following the tried and tested pickup artistry model. <laughs> so back in back in 2005 you had neil strauss's the game which was a bestseller globally which yeah. gave tips and techniques basically you know to trick women into into bed you know treating women as just mere bodies to be seduced right but that that whole approach of trying to tell men that they are somehow worthless unless they're successful with women and hey look here's a quick way here's some quick techniques to trick them right and you know it just costs you the sum of x amount that's been going for years and years and so he's just capitalized on that same approach he also presents himself uh, himself as embodying the perfect form of masculinity, right? Which is, um, at least that's what he's saying, the only way to true independence and happiness for, for all men in this world. He is living his own dream, and yet yeah. the man seems royally pissed off all the time. 
I, uh, so is <laughs> anger an essential part of the manosphere? Well, yes. I mean, there's there's different groups within the manosphere, and they yeah, we're going to talk about that in the second. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, there is there is um an overriding sense of anger and resentment and bitterness. They're not happy people, <laughs> essentially. Okay, I spend a lot of the time on the internet. Actually, way too much, but that's a separate issue. Anyway, I hear this term a lot. But even so, I only have a vague idea of what it actually is. So what is the Manosphere? Okay, so it's a network of blogs, forums, websites, where men from different groups come together, they coalesce for their different reasons, which uh, united uh, by a a hatred of anti uh, feminism of women of progression as well a a belief that for society to improve and predominantly for men's lives to to be to be better and for men to be back in their rightful place at the top of uh, the hierarchy uh there needs to be a return to those sorts of traditional values and gender roles um back so sort of, think back to the, like the 1950s <laughs> where men were men and women were women and each knew their place the men were the breadwinners women should be at home um and you know and and then then the world would be a better place right yeah um what is the primary home of the manosphere or is it just scattered around uh, like i don't know 4chan or reddit yeah. or hidden message boards or how it, does it work it, it's not as if i mean you could you can go you can find space is called the manosphere sites you can do that but there is evidence of it all throughout the internet where you get sort of dedicated sites i mean some are shut down some are reopening linked with incels and voluntary celibates or men's rights activists or the pickup artists community men going their own way um you can get fathers for justice who um i think need to be considered a little bit differently to the rest of the manosphere because they are I think they, their primary concern is obviously one of a very real issue affecting men and um, the realization that actually um, women, well, you know, women shouldn't be just deemed the primary caregivers of children anyway. So, you know, that, that kind of supports their argument. Um, but you can find evidence of their activity, not just on dedicated places and forums, but on mainstream social media sites. So all of the all of the main big ones, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, even though they say their rules and regulations say that they don't allow hate speech and misogyny. Um, and then you get the more clandestine sites, the sites um, that are that were designed for abuse <laughs> and and trolling and you know they that's their ethos basically so all of the chans 4chan 8chan 16chan keeps yeah. going um reddit um you'll even get evidence of manosphere activity and certainly the language is seeping as well into things like gaming sites as well so discord twitch um and you probably do as well get you manosphere um, users as well, you know, on on those sorts of platforms. All right, you mentioned some of the groups. Uh, yes. I think you said men's right activists, men yeah. going their own way. Yeah. Uh, we already talked about pickup artists. We all know what that is, <laughs> and incels as well. And then there's the fathers for what was it again? Fathers' rights activists. Fathers' rights activists. Okay, we're familiar with. With pickup artists and insult, we're going to talk about insults more a bit later. Okay. But can you break down men's right activists and men going their own way groups yeah. for us a little bit? Because I'm slightly confused as as to what that is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So as I said, they, they, there's kind of commonalities, but the kind of main aims, I would say, probably differ somewhat. So men's rights activists or MRAs for short. These are the contemporary manifestation of the um, the original um, men's 
rights movement, um, which can be dated back to the sort of 1960s, 1970s, originally started as the men's liberation movement, which was an ally of feminism, second wave feminism. The two worked in tandem together, recognizing the problems of rigid gender and sex roles, you know, men feeling pressured to be the breadwinner, women wanting women wanting to be more than sex objects or housewives although obviously if you you know if you want to be a housewife that's great but it's about choice um but um they there was a lot of discord between the two movements and whereas you still have um facets of the original men's liberation movement where you have male feminists and men who you know who are allies um you had a splinter group develop into the men's rights movement where instead of really focusing the energies on men's problems you know men as victims of domestic abuse the fact that there's no shelters for these victims mm. the high suicide rates you know, lots right. of lots of genuine issues no, it would be let's take away from what women have achieved. <laughs> so instead of saying fighting for men's shelters, it'd be let's shut down all the women's shelters. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of think, well, you're not really helping those that you, you claim to, to, to be concerned about. And that, that sort of attitude of blaming feminism, blaming women has continued into the men's rights activists today. And really where you see um, a sort of, uh, uh, almost like a collaboration, I'd say, is thing. So the men's rights activists are sort of uh, cross over with like the alt right as well in terms of, um, and, and this, I think as well in terms, particularly within maybe American politics in, in particular, that you'll really see some of the, the narratives of the, of, of men's rights activists kind of fitting within right, uh, the far right discourse as well. And then men go in their own way. So with these, with this community, you have men who have just come to the decision that because women are so inher inherently evil and problematic, that they're just going to cut all ties with them. Life would be better if there was no interaction with women whatsoever. But the contradiction is many of them are married <laughs> and um, it's impossible to cut, I mean, what, what do they do in work? Do they just not refuse to speak to another woman or refuse to speak to a woman in a shop, for example, or ever? But so they post their stories of how they deliberately ignored a woman or they haven't spoken to a woman today and how their life is so much better because of it. Um, so yeah. what, your, your sister calls you and she's like, um, hey, can you help me move? And you just hang up the phone and you're yeah. like, my, my yeah. day is awesome. And they would brag about that. Right, right, okay. So it's more of an of an online thing because yes, it's, it's impossible out in the real world. It's really performative. performative. I love that. But what what what's what's the are. aim? What's the aim of? What's the ultimate goal of these men going their own way? Just to be some sort of like an ascetic monk in the desert, or or I I can't I have trouble imagining what's the dream I mean, life here. The the aim is. I mean, it's whatever they <laughs> they wanted to be that week. Um, All right, so it's fluid. It's fluid because I mean, they, to be a true mug towel, it would be you know you have no interaction. But they also appreciate that in today's society, which is in favour of women, according to them, it's pretty impossible not to have any interaction. So that doesn't then diminish their mug towel status. But, Sorry, yeah, the what status? Mugtow. So men go in the wrong way. It's, All right. It's an abbreviation. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm um, sorry. Yep. All right. Mugtow. Yeah. Right. Got I it. Mean, you, there's also they um, love their acronyms, don't they? Oh yes, yes. You don't. You yeah. don't. You don't say the full the full names of the communities. Yeah. That's yeah. That that shows you as a complete normie, an outsider. <laughs> Um, I mean, you also get the other groups I didn't mention are things yeah. like the um, NoFap. All right, so that's yeah. I know what that one is. You that's do know no that masturbation. one. No masturbation, yes. and then you get superpowers yeah. after a couple of months. Enlightenment, basically. Enlightenment, right? And yeah. they, they cross over with again far right groups like the Proud Boys. 
is the Proud Boys before they disbanded, and then I believe they've come back. Um, you know, had the hashtag no wanks as well. So <laughs> a lot of the ideologies, you know, they kind of shift and they're picked up elsewhere. Um, you also get trad cons. So as I said, you know, that conservative, far right ideology. So trad cons very much based with that sort of Christian fundamentalism, want to go back to the 1950s, rigid gender roles. Um, although it's a bit, the term is a bit pejorative in the manosphere. So not many people say, you know, so they'll talk about trad con ideology, but not very few people would say, oh, yes, I identify as a trad con. So were all of these groups kind of born out of the pickup artist movement or no, is it more no, complicated it, than that? I think it's more complicated and I mean, certainly they're facilitated online that they wouldn't wouldn't be in their current manifestations if it wasn't for digital technologies. But no, um, as I said, the, some men's rights activists go pre-internet oh so not pre-internet but pre the world wide web so yeah. they you know that the the idea that men somehow had to strike back for their very survival that society is somehow misandrist and feminism is the scourge of all evil that you know that goes back to the 1970s um and um and this was even pick up artistry. Some of these ideas, you know, they're not, you know, the fact that, you know, so seduce women and things like that. I mean, these are not, they're not particularly novel. They're just dressed up in a new fashion online. Yeah. Um, is, is there a part of the manosphere that is just like, let's focus on ourselves and, and all of this stuff without the, we have to take back what women have whatever stole from us or all of that stuff is there a more reasonable part of the manosphere or is it all just is the underlying theme of all of these groups always uh, you know rooted in misogyny um so as i mentioned father's rights activists who okay. are part of it and i think you know i, I think i'm quite try, try to be quite careful about distinct not, not sort of um homogenizing them with all the yeah. you know the the abuse and and um uh, you know, offensiveness, but um, I mean, there, there is, there's going to be pockets where there's going to be less of the, you know, the the sort of abusive behaviours. But unfortunately, the majority now of these spaces have been manipulated, um, and they're sort of you know, that's they take centre stage now. The misogyny, the racism, the homophobia, all of that, that's, that, that is what you will find more, you know, more often than, than anything that is supportive or healthy. What is red pill or red pilling? Right. Okay. As it pertains to the manosphere, what does that mean? I yes. know it from the matrix. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, an ideology that's predominantly linked with men's rights activists, MRAs. Um, as you said, it is co-opted from the matrix, which is ironic. Um, uh, given, so it, it's essentially, if you, if you I have the choice of taking the red or the blue pill, like obviously Neo's character in the film, where if you take the blue pill, you know, you just, you're just happy to, to live in the facade, basically. And if you take the red pill, you're waking up to life's realities that you know, the society is skewed in favor of women, women are inher inherently and biologically evil. You know, men, men are the true alphas, but they are repressed by this, this, these, you know, the, the inequalities against them in society and the reason I said it's um ironic is the Wachowski sisters who made the film have said that the red pill blue pill allegory is about transgenderism which is something that is not recognized in the manosphere in fact transphobia is prevalent in the manosphere because the very the very notion of trans people their very existence is denied uh so they believe in the, they believe that you know biological is bi biology is immutable so the very fact that they continue to use this this allegory when that's not what it was created for you know in fact the complete opposite it it just you know i i, I just i just think well <laughs> Yeah, that's very interesting. 
Yeah, that reminds me of the movie Wall Street from the 80s. I don't know if you've seen it with Michael Douglas. Yeah. I've uh, with Oliver Stone directed that movie and he said that the the main villain uh Gordon Gecko played by Michael Douglas was designed as a really despicable character and then he was co-opted by all of these Wall Street types who thought he was the coolest guy and then they yeah. imitated his fashion and all that stuff so <laughs> it seems that it happens quite often. <laughs> Um, exactly. Anyway, as a as a researcher, you must have spent a lot of time on these chans and and message boards and blogs and stuff. Did you ever catch yourself being kind of affected by all of this content? I mean, do you do you think we're all susceptible to this kind of dangerous thinking if we spend enough time devouring this content, even if we originally mm -hmm. hold completely opposite views? That's a really a really interesting and important question actually um so yes i spent almost i think well it was about three years without a break um immersed in usually in cell sites and communities but also the broader manosphere and um, i also interviewed self-identified um current and former incels as well um and and yes i'm you know it, it i'm not too proud to admit it deeply affected me although and i and i thought i thought i'd taken all all the all the steps to kind of prepare myself for this and also maybe a little naively um thought i'm a criminologist i you know i i this is this is my this is my work you know i understand you know the, the depravity of human nature um but I was more concerned going into the research, particularly when I directly interacted with incels about my online security. So things like my social media accounts and what they could find out about me. Um, I was more concerned perhaps for that side of it rather than my own emotional well-being. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, as a woman researching misogynists, spending a long time just reading deeply hateful posts um yeah i that you know I, that obviously affected me um and sort of really kind of yeah kind of hit, hit home to me you know about you know about my place as a woman in society um but also that point you said, and I, I know you're kind of alluding to like radicalization, like how easy is that? Is it to happen? And I mean, it's certainly not the case that you just watch a few things and you're instantly indoctrinated, you know, and, and there's, there's, um, external internal factors what else has gone on in your life and obviously the person you are lots of other things you know for why people might be more vulnerable to forms of radicalization but there is certainly something about spending a long time being immersed in this sort of content without having any counter narratives as well so of course I've got all of that in the work that I do. I can spend hours and hours researching, but I'm also talking then a, a lot about, obviously, other things. I'm not just engaged in incel ideologies. Um, but what really, what was really stark for me was when I realised I was becoming desensitised and um, posts which I would have been horrified at early on in the research start I, I was just becoming I don't want to say complacent about but they weren't affecting me as much and that was the wake-up call for me where I thought no I, I want to be I know this probably sounds a little bit masochistic and I don't mean it in that way but I, you know, I want to realize that they are hateful that they are abusive I want to understand that they are harmful I don't want to just take it you know just go oh oh look there's another another racist or misogynistic post you know I, I, I never want to you know realize um how you know how bad they are uh, and so yeah that that process of desensitization I think it's really clear that that people go through that people go through that who then don't have any any healthy narratives or material or people outside to kind of help them cope with that. Um, so, so, so yeah, it's, um, you can, you can understand how, 
how people and particularly those who may be vulnerable as well you know that they that they're in you know a bad place in their lives they're looking for answers um looking for solidarity and support which unfortunately is the last thing they often get in these places um but yeah that if if that's all people are engaging with that's all they're exposed to you can you can certainly see how these ideas can start to encroach on people's identities that's a bit scary i remember spending just a couple of like 10 years ago i spent a couple of months on the random board of 4chan and it was pretty bad after just a couple of months i was like this is not good for me i felt that my thought processes were somehow changing yeah and um you know so for someone who doesn't have an academic background or support like you said and is younger it just seems like really easy for them to get completely sucked in fast yeah absolutely i mean i also had times where i felt pretty nihilistic and that's not yeah. usually my sort of demeanor and it's that realization of wow that's what incels say <laughs> that's how incels act i mean i certainly didn't feel like i was becoming an incel not that i'd be allowed um i could be a femcel but i couldn't be an incel um because i as a woman you wouldn't be allowed um but um yeah that that thought of oh i'm having some pretty dark thoughts now when did i become fatalistic you know you make you you make the connection that yeah, I think I need a break now from this sort of content. So the most well-known group of the Venusphere, we mentioned them a couple of times already, are the incels, men who form a subculture around the fact that they're involuntary celibate. They're also infamous because they have perpetrated many deadly, straight-up terrorist attacks, right? Such as the uh, Isla Vista killings, yeah. I think that's Elliot Roger, uh, or the Toronto van attack. Um you wrote a book about them called The Incel Rebellion. I believe it's publicly accessible online. Yeah. What makes an individual go down this extremely dark path where they proclaim, the, proclaim themselves as hopeless outcasts? Yeah, so um, so as I said, I, 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 well, I, I, one of my main sort of research questions was to try and understand why people would become an incel. What makes an incel? Why would you self-identify as one? I mean, given the fact that it seems a pretty, a pretty depressing existence. Um, and, and so what I found, um, and this is, and this is a difficult thing because you, I mean, even with the interviews, I feel like there's, and that I need to kind of, go beyond the surface of what was said to me and like and certainly look beyond what you know what people are posting online um because um online you'll find lots of narratives about and and it's not about becoming an incel for for incels it's a what they call um you know it's waking up to you know their life circumstance that this is something they always were that they just didn't realize it before um and so how they i think part of that process to finding out they're an incel if you want to believe their wording is um is, is finding like-minded others it's finding the sites it's it's right. hearing other people's experiences which align with their own um it's being provided with those seductive explanations for all their problems that are external to themselves as well so it's another contradiction on the one hand they're waking up to the fact that they are the lowest of the low they they you know you you're basically the scum of the earth um but actually you can't help that that's that's you were just born that way and it's because and you know just because you're born this way um you could be happy but women won't let you be because they don't want to be with you basically um so um then um the stories are very much that you know of um rejection that you know loads of you know the stories of rejection which are interesting given that I would hazard a guess most people will have been rejected at some point in their life that there will be an experience where you may have liked somebody romantically but they didn't feel that same way about you oh yeah <laughs> yeah and I'm not saying that's not painful 
because obviously at the time it really is, particularly when you're an adolescent. Um, but it's almost like a rite of passage. I'm not saying oh yeah, everybody has to go through it, but most people do go through these things. But for incels, they it shapes them. It shapes their whole identity, their character. They they put everything on that one experience or experiences, um, and then they will they will struggle to. They they think oh because I've had that rejection, I can never approach another woman again. They then learn about incels, and then it all just makes sense basically. Mm. Um, and going back to the point I said earlier about having to be kind of careful and critical about some of the explanations that are given for being an incel as well um there are papers now that are coming out um in the academic community um um which say that because so they they so they, they demarcate between misogynist incels and incels um as and and i i appreciate that you do i think we need to realize that incels are not all homogenous um but i think kind of saying that there's misogynist incels and then there's incels it's like there's good incels and there's bad incels and i think it's a lot more murkier than that and also once you start say labeling one particular group misogynist then that's just giving them license as well but anyway i think it's useful to say misogynist incels but understand kind of more beyond that but also but some of the work that's coming out and I've certainly seen this written online and also in my interviews where explanations for in for becoming an incel um involve things like mental health and depression and neuro neurodiversity and I feel very uncomfortable about this because I think one it's stigmatizing these already stigmatized issues um two it's not a default as well we don't just want to say all incels have mental health issues and anybody with a mental health issue would then be vulnerable to becoming an incel i think there, there might there might be a link and and actually i certainly talked about that in my book that there's an, there is an association and certainly when people are more vulnerable that they could then be seduced by these ideologies more easier but i don't would never just want to kind of make it as a default um and and also i think it's important as well that they that mental mental illness or um and misogyny and offensive behavior they're not they're not mutually they don't have to be mutually exclusive as well and it's not an excuse as well even if somebody is mentally unwell if they are then espousing really horrible misogynistic and hateful and racist things they can still be misogynistic and hateful and racist and things um you know they can be both basically as well it's not an it's not an excuse and i mean then there's plenty of of people who struggle with these issues who are not abusive <laughs> as well so i think that's that's always important important and and particularly when we're talking about incels now and there's obviously lots of uh, discussion about whether or not they should be deemed to be terrorists and things like that we, you know and and uh, as an extremist group but we don't talk about mental health um when we talk about other extremist or terrorist groups we're not saying nobody was saying with isis oh wonder you know wonder if they were doing this because they were mentally unwell um pretty sure you had mentally unwell people in there as well but it's interesting how the narrative is kind of moving to that direction to kind of almost excuse some of the ideologies, which I'm a little bit uncomfortable with. But as I said, I also, you know, I'm acutely aware that yes, there are vulnerabilities and yes, there are people in the incel community that have these issues and they genuinely need support. And even you get some people that are maybe become incel because they were looking for that support in the first place and then got swept up in the toxicity. Um, but yeah, it's, I think we just need to look upon this a bit more critically. Mm. So what are the basic tenets of incel ideology? How do they see the world? You mentioned biology already. But there, yeah. there must be more. I know they're using special terms. I don't know if that's incel specifically, this Chad and Stacy and oh, Virgin that, and Chad and that, all that yeah. stuff. That is incel. Okay. Can we go through that, that a little bit? Yeah, so that's that's the kind of um, lexicon of, of incels, but right. it, it has kind of permeated elsewhere in the manosphere as well. Um, so we mentioned the red pill already, and that is an ideology that is that, that has been embraced by incels, but 
but at a lesser extent when you compare that with the so-called black pill. Um, so the black pill is the extension of that red pill. So they've woken up, they realize that society is unfairly structured in favor of women and feminism is really bad and men are now disempowered. And then the black pill is that realization that your circumstance as an incel, because it's like the, the, the cementing of being an incel, your circumstance is unchangeable, it's immutable. So that's where you get that nihilistic worldview. That, right, so you can't do anything about it. That's it. That's it. You're it. This, this is why they say things like, I didn't become an incel. I was always an incel. I no, it just it just took me till whatever time for me to realize that and so that that's that that the black pill and with the black pill actually and I really kind of had to interrogate for this because okay what is that I mean I understand what it's about but what is it what is it you know in terms of people believing in the black pill how what, what is it and actually broken down it's just lots of pseudoscientific studies and surveys from dating sites um, that they use to support it. And there's also a manipulation of um, theories from evolutionary psychology and biology as well that they use to then say, you know, look, we have scientifically proven this point about the world, you know, the world as it is. And so there's certain ideas within it which did not originate with incels that they have then twisted to suit their, their, their philosophy. So you get things like hypergamy, which comes from um, like the Indian caste system, where it's about marrying up. So uh, it, it, families would want their daughter to marry somebody richer. So they get they get the money, they get the dowry, right? So that's hypergamy, marrying up. So incels believe all women are hypergamous, that they're only interested in money and appearance. Um, then you get things like the 80-20 rule, which is um, it, it's a manipulation of Pareto's principle, where you had the wealth distributed in um, Italy. And this is the, the actually, you've got, um, um, uh, so you've got, uh, eight, let me get this right. You've got 80% of women who are competing for the 20% of men um, right. and then vice versa um, because women are only driven by looks. And then you've got from that, you've got lookism where you it's about changing your appearance to, to make your life better. So you can see actually there's a crossover with Andrew Tate, for example, even though he's not an incel and I don't, you know, he's not, he's not necessarily connected with incels per se and they certainly don't it's not as if incels are embracing him um either he is the actualization of the chad as he said about um the most look best the best looking guy you know he's white he's you know muscular he's got you know he's got incredible sexual prowess basically um but um, that, that idea that you can change your appearance to improve your life, and it involves things like um, um, bone smashing, where they'll take hammers to their faces to, because they believe that a more chiseled definition is going to make them more handsome. Um, but that completely undermines the black pill that says their life circumstance is unchangeable. So they're trying to change it. And then, but then, so mass, and you know, unsurprisingly, it's just full of mass contradiction. Um, but yeah, so things like the halo effect as well, which is a psychological concept, um, where good, pe uh, good looking people are more favored in society, um, where there's been studies that show things like in job interviews, that an attractive person is more likely to get a job over a non attractive person. And of course, what do we mean by attractive? Conventionally attractive, so, you know, societal standards of what is good looking. So there are, and this is what is uncomfortable with incels, that, that there are things which make sense. There's things to be challenged. There's things to kind of be discussed here. Um, they make some valid points, which, you know, is, is you know, it's, it's almost uncomfortable amongst the cacophony of abuse. Um, but then it's the way that they manipulate it and present it. Um, and then use all the, the, you know, the really, so the words that, you know, they've got their own language, as you said, Chad, Stacy, the, the most attractive 
woman um and becky's who's the studious nerd and women the uh, the list goes on for women women are never referred to as women they're females and then things like foids because they're devoid of any humanity they're robots and things like toilets and holes and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and there's lots of um words which have cell on the end for the various forms of incels um there's even the racially diverse incels um which have some pretty racist <laughs> kind of um words attached to them as well and um and they're seen as lower even lower on the hierarchy if that's even possible because of course whiteness is is what is revered but yeah lots <laughs> okay um for you for your book you talk to a lot of incels you said did you Ten. get a sense of what kind of lives these people are leading and what are their circumstances outside of their digital lives or are they like vastly different or are there some commonalities that you could well describe? interestingly um I think there was only one that said that they'd admitted to anybody offline that they were an incel. Everybody okay. else kept their incel identity secret and they said it was because they wanted to avoid the stigma, basically, that's now attached to the community. Um, but also, interestingly, they were really keen to impress that they were highly educated. Because, of course, then that, that validates what they're telling me as well. I'm really, you know, I've got, you know, loads of qualifications. They got, they wanted to say they had good jobs. Um, and so, of course, I'd be like, well, surely you could get a woman then. You know, if you've got a good job, you've got money. We know this. And they, then they'd say, but, oh, no, my looks are so abhorrent that it, it just, and this is why I said earlier that looks still trump um, money. Okay. Um, uh, so they, these are not like people living in their mother's no. basements. Well, that's that's what they wanted to tell me, though. Again, this is what they're telling me. They were, and that's interesting in itself that they wanted me to think that in every other area of their life, aside from sex and romance, that they were somehow doing okay. They were successful. They, um, although although the, yeah, most of them would say that they didn't have, you know, that they, they didn't speak to women as well um when i asked them about their relationships with family members um some would say you know oh no all women are heinous or no them fine or they would make that they would distinguish between their female relatives and other women oh no they, they might you know my mother's fine she's the only person only woman that i can trust that sort of thing but they it was really interesting they wanted to challenge the stereotype of incels being neats so not in education or employment or training. They, you know, basically the sort of basement dweller. They yeah. wanted to challenge that. Um, and so, and, and, but also, which was unnerving, is where one said to me, um, you'd be surprised, you know, incels are everywhere. They, you know, they're, they're not just sort of isolated. Um, you're probably working with lots of incels who really hate you, <laughs> which was a bit nice. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to ask. So it's actually possible that some some of the people in our lives, men, might be incels online, but offline you you could never guess. I mean, that's what they wanted. Again, that's what they wanted to tell. So me. that's what they were saying, that's but that's not necessarily the truth. Um, I mean, I would, and why I would critically question that is if they, if, you know, if they were well, I mean, it's not. I don't want to say, oh, they definitely weren't well educated, or they didn't have jobs. Um, but to me, the biggest issue was that they weren't interacting with women um, and they didn't have the confidence to speak to women. Um, not even in, I mean, I appreciate, you know, they were speaking with me online um, and they were really, they, they, I mean, they, they were really forthcoming. They, they were very eager to talk. In fact, um, there was no reluctance there. Um, so it was, it was as if, you know, give them a platform, they'll speak. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, 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 the commonality was that they, you know, that they don't interact with women. And of course you think, well, if you have this, you know, if you have this other life, then surely you would be interacting with women sometimes. So it just seemed that the stories didn't marry up. Was there anything that surprised you when you were talking to incels? Um, yeah, so... 
what surprised me was the fact that I really struggled with feeling sympathetic for them at times. Um, you know, this is not to deny, you know, the, you know, the misogyny, the abuse, um, so not to excuse it in any way, shape or form. But, um, you know, the, they are, they, they really did open up about stories of vulnerability beyond the, oh, I was rejected at the age of 13 when I asked a girl out, you know, actual things that sounded really hard, you know, in their childhood and things. Um, and say, you know, again, the mental health issues and things. So I, for me, there was that tension to try and navigate between, yes, I can sympathize, I can recognize there is humanity. And that's always, always important. You know, people are not one dimensional, are they? They can do these really abhorrent things and then actually still be, you know, still have some decent qualities or say, you know, or need some support um, and be genuinely suffering in some respect. But of course, this, that's all happening together. It doesn't cancel, you no, know, things don't cancel each other out. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I thought I do feel, you know, I, I do, I did feel sympathy and I kind of, I kind of maybe didn't think I would do that basically. Okay. We're drawing to a close, uh, up until now, young men who kind of feel left behind have been snatched up by various right wing figures like Jordan Peterson offering pretty stale conservative, you know, solutions such as, you know, be more like a lobster or something. But recently, there's been some talk on the left about especially working class men facing more and more structural disadvantages. Like, um, I don't know if you know Richard Reeves. Uh, he published a book called okay. Of Boys and Men. Yeah. I haven't read it, but I believe yeah. it's about the rapidly growing education and pay gaps yeah. in, in favor of, of women and the rising alienation and suicide rates, especially amongst uh, young men. I watched an interview with him and he says we should keep having a conversation about the advancement of women but also have a conversation about what could we do for men who are struggling. Yeah. Do you think that's part of the solution to, to I don't know, insult them or, oh, no, abs uh, ab or the manosphere? Yeah, no, absolutely. We really do need to be involving young men and boys in these conversations and having them from a much, much earlier age. It's too late to start talking about things like healthy relationships and consent and gender equality when they're teenagers. They're online much earlier and they're on gaming sites and things like that. And their ideas, you know, they're already forming their kind of worldviews and stuff and, you know, kind of trying to kind of grapple with, you know, with kind of complexities of their lives and stuff long before. So absolutely, there's a real place for education. And yet, it's about men and boys being allies to women but yes recognizing that the same structures that are oppressing women are oppressing men too as well you know the, the when you get something like Andrew Tate saying there's just this one way to be a man this hyper masculine which is so unrealistic as well and the encouragement of coercive control like this is this is how you successful women is essentially you abuse them you know do you know it's and it's also really condescending you know it's kind of saying oh yeah so men are just you know they're just you're just going to be aggressive and abuse right no <laughs> you know men men don't need to be like that and i'd probably say most men don't want to be you know they don't necessarily want to be deemed aggressive and abusive and misogynist um so yeah absolutely need to be having those those conversations the support but it's not i think it's beyond that as well though i think i mean i mentioned briefly about things like um whether or not incels terrorists but certainly there can be more done in terms of policy and um social media platforms in terms of not you know not tolerating some of the really hateful content and things um you know more you know more representation in tech because they're not really understanding who's been disproportionately abused online. Um, but yes, there's lots of different approaches. But I think going back um, to the to you know your question about um, should we be supporting young men and boys? Well, yes, absolutely. I think there's very real problems that are facing um, young men and boys in our societies today. As a bit of an Eastern European commie, basically a James Bond villain, I have to <laughs> ask you um, the following at the end: What's the link between capitalism? Oh. Atmosphere. oh yeah of course it is of course it is right um i mean right okay i think uh, without focusing on the communities themselves i'm just going to say, say how the manosphere has developed right is you know profit driven 
social media companies and the tech companies, they don't care about user safety. Right. They yeah. care about profit, right? They care about clicks, attention, likes, what's going to get the, you know, the, you know, the most views and things like that. So they are a huge part of this problem in terms of propagating the ideologies as well. Um, but yeah, capitalism, it's just, underpins everything doesn't it it goes hand in hand with all the rest of the oppressions absolutely and i mean we go back to who we started with andrew tay what is he driven by right you know he is driven by money right hustle university exactly <laughs> you know he's a hustler it's, it's there he's not even trying to hide it um so so yeah i think you know it, capitalism is a you know a driving force of these communities Last question. The, the title of this podcast is You're a Trash, so I have to ask you something trashy <laughs> at the end. What is a fem cell? Oh. You dropped that on me during the interview. Um, so female incel, basically. Although, um, I mean, incel... Is that an actual thing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely is, a, is an actual thing. I mean, incel originally was for anybody. Doesn't matter, irrespective of gender. But it's since been mostly appropriated by men, right? Men who have an agenda against women but yeah there are there are fem cells an offshoot you know of women who struggle to find romantic and sexual relationships but they're not viewed as real incels by male incels because they believe that regardless of your circumstance as a woman you will always find a man that wants to sleep with you because you have your sexual market value even if you're deemed conventionally ugly you will st man will still will still be a man that'll sleep with that woman so therefore a woman can never ever be an incel okay so they they exist mm -hmm. but they're not part of the community um, they're not part of the you get you, well you get some certainly on facebook you get some closed groups that they're incel oh, they actually use involuntary celibate to try and distinguish ah, now from incel okay. and they, they do wow. allow women and that's you know that's a bit of a clue as well where it's like the more misogynistic and probably the ones that are like no women allowed oh sorry it'd be no females or foids or whatever horrible term they're using for women that day um but yeah no and you get fem cell communities as well This is all fascinating. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you had a cold, but you still you still did it. Uh, I got through so it. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you. yeah, we got through it. Um, where can people follow your work or find your books? Yes. Yeah, so... Would you like to share any of your social media accounts? <laughs> uh, yeah, so my book, The Intel Rebellion, is um, open access. So that means it is free to read online. You can just Google it. It's available from the publisher's site. But I think well, you, if you just Googled it, you'd be able to be able to access that. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Lisa underscore Segura. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks so much. This was wonderful. I hope we, we get to talk about this again. There's so much stuff to unpack there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Hi. Thanks for watching. Just want to give a quick shout out to my amazing patron, uh, Thea Dejman Taichi. You're awesome. Thank you so much. If you want to support Eurotrash, you can do that on Patreon. You'll find the link below. Uh, yeah. Oh, and please hit subscribe. Thanks.